Samuel de Champlain settled in this fertile land on the St. Lawrence. He chose a place where the great river narrows. The Indians called it Quebec. Here, in his later years, he spent some of his happiest hours, tending the garden he loved. Often as he worked, his thoughts must have drawn him back in memory to a time when finding a passage to China was the goal of all his dreams. Each summer, with native companions, he would push westward in search of this goal, a gateway to the riches of the Orient. But in those early times, Champlain was forced to return to France for supplies almost every year. Atlantic crossings were always perilous. In his journals, Champlain wrote of a particular voyage which took more than 10 weeks due to the violent storms. The men ate only salt meat and sea biscuits and drank water which tasted worse each day. By the time the ship reached the Grand Banks, the crew had little stomach left to do battle with offshore flows and fog and steer between icebergs 40 fathoms high. Though watch was kept every minute, day and night, it seemed at times they would not come out alive. Yet, year after year, Champlain returned to continue his explorations, driven on by stories of a great western sea where the waters never froze. But nobody could know this country without having wintered here. And winter lasts six months. Champlain learned what hardships were to be faced during his very first winter. On Lille Saint Croix, snow fell as early as October the 6th. By January, what little food was left had frozen. The native peoples were faced with starvation. But though Champlain's men suffered greatly from cold and hunger, it was scurvy that killed them. Of 79 men who wintered there on the island, 35 died before spring. Four years later, the settlers built their permanent habitation. Champlain believed the level and fruitful land at Quebec would, when cultivated, bear as richly as the soil of his native France. Yet, a league or two away, they discovered the remains of an earlier encampment. One Jacques Cartier had been forced to abandon 70 years before. It was a harsh reminder of the adversities all pioneers must face in this land. The riches of the Orient lay far beyond the great western sea, and the way was often blocked by impossible terrain. But nothing could deter Champlain. He would undertake a portage in the heat of summer, clad in armor, tormented by mosquitoes and black fly and burdened with all the arms and baggage of an explorer. Amongst the Indians who traveled with him, his fortitude was legendary. For 12 years, he endured the killing winters and traveled ceaselessly each summer on his never-ending quest until, at last, he reached the great sea in the land of the Hurons.
it was a disappointment that might have crushed a lesser man. This was not the salt Pacific Ocean. Here was no gateway to the Orient. It was merely the fresh water of yet another vast inland lake. To Champlain, it proved to be a turning point. From here, it seemed, he could see more clearly the endless possibilities of this great land. When he returned to the neglected settlement at Quebec, he immediately saw to its restoration and prepared the ground for autumn sowing. He felt that with the cooperation of the native people, it would be possible to build on the new continent a strong racially mixed empire. Surrounded by the bounty of this land, the miraculous rebirth of each spring, the plentiful harvests, he was content to know the colony would never again experience the desperation of those early hungry winters. In a letter to France just before he died, Champlain wrote, In this great land is one of the best rivers in the world. The beauty of the countryside cannot be overpraised, for the fertility of the soil, the extent of the forests, and the opportunities for hunting and fishing in abundance. All these things hold out their arms to you.